Following the static fire test of Booster 9, which saw the Raptor engines ignite on the orbital launch mount for the first time in months, SpaceX's Starbase is now entering a new phase. The company has collected data about the new water deluge system, and many new structures have been added to the launch pad recently. One of these structures is another big boy tank arriving at Starbase, which was sent to the launch site yesterday. Immediately upon arrival, the tank was finally in place, and the Versabar lifter was removed. Moved. It was quite a long journey for that tank. Weeks it's been since it first began its trek on the road. The tank is impressive, but that transport truck and rig used to transport it may be even more so, not to mention having to drive it. With the arrival of the tank, it appears that we might be bearing witness to the final chapter of the journey of the tank meant for the booster bidet system, for lack of another name, marking a significant milestone in its overall completion. But more interestingly, Starbase engineers have been working on this peculiar white steel ring. There is currently no confirmation from the company about the purpose of this special structure, but based on its shape, that is a heavy-duty table, and it's even larger than a starship. We have some ideas to what this might be, which include a suborbital launch mount, a planal orbital launch mount, or a full-stack testing pad. It also looks more like a turntable or a workstation for the wide bay, but a suborbital launch mount would be the most likely, meaning the current suborbital launch pads could be replaced, which is a good thing since they've been problematic for a long time. However, due to its white color, it also gives off the vibe of a component of the Starship HLS variant, you know, the one that's supposed to be used for NASA's Artemis program. Even so, it's quite ambitious to think they're starting to make more orbital launch tables. Remember way back when we were going to have launch pads all over the country and the world? It may be time to scale up that process and get more launch pads built outside Boca Chica first. But in the end, what could this structure be? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Next, the new Mega Bay will be completed soon. Let's take a brief look. So far, two new extension pieces for the LR11000 crane at the build site have just been brought in. These are the components to make the derrick used for heavy loads. On other trucks, you can see the section for the second luffing jib of the crane. This will give the additional reach needed to finish off the second mega bay structure. Additionally, the star factory that's under construction is being expanded. It is set to replace factory tents for the production of ships and boosters. Another building on site has been seen to have stacks of full-size Starlink version 2 satellites waiting for launch, but it remains to be seen whether Ship 28 will be the first to launch some of these spacecraft. With all these activities, the production site is essentially non-stop, working on future boosters and ships. In fact, Ship 30 got a little bit taller this week. SpaceX certainly doesn't let any time go to waste while they test and iterate on current and future designs of Starship. Hopefully, it'll soon get the launch license for the next flights. In other notable news, Virgin Galactic finally launched its first space customers to the edge of the cosmos, a major step toward delivering on decades of promises. The rocket-powered space plane VSS Unity, developed by the space tourism company founded by British billionaire Richard Branson, Branson took off at 8.30 a.m. MT from a New Mexico spaceport attached to a massive twin fuselage mothership. It carried three customers, entrepreneur and health and wellness coach Keisha Shahaf and her daughter Anastasia Mayers, the first space travelers from Antigua who won their seats in a fundraiser drawing, as well as former Olympian John Goodwin who competed as a canoeist in the 1972 Munich Summer Games. Goodwin became the second person with Parkinson's disease to travel to space. The group's journey began at Virgin Galactic Spaceport in New Mexico, where the passengers boarded VSS Unity as it sat attached beneath the wing of the mothership, the VMS Eve. The Eve took off much like an airplane, barreling down a runway before ascending to around 12,200 meters. After reaching its designated altitude, the Eve released the Unity, which then fired its rocket engine for about a minute as it swooped directly upward, setting it vaulting towards toward the stars. The vehicle ventured more than 80 kilometers above Earth's surface, an altitude the U.S. government considers the edge of outer space. Though internationally speaking, the Kármán line, at 100 kilometers above sea level, is often used to mark the boundary between our planet and space, but there is a lot of gray area. The space plane reached supersonic speeds as it hurled upward, and at the peak of its flight, the vehicle spent a few minutes in weightlessness as it entered freefall and glided back to the spaceport for a runway landing 
landing at 9.30 a.m. MT. The journey lasted an hour. After returning to Earth, Goodwin described the flight as a quite surreal, but without a doubt the most exciting day of my life. I was shocked at the things you feel, Mayer said. You are so much more connected to everything than you would expect to be. You felt like a part of the team, part of the ship, part of the universe, part of Earth. That was incredible, and I'm still starstruck. This experience has also given me this beautiful feeling that if I can do this, I can do anything, Shayhaf said. The flight was Virgin's second commercial mission following on the heels of a flight on June 29th that carried three Italian Air Force researchers, two Virgin pilots, and a company engineer to an altitude of nearly 53 miles. That flight was chartered by the Italian government while Thursday's flight was the first with private astronauts. Virgin officials say some 800 applicants are on the waiting list to fly aboard the company's space plane. Blue Origin, owned by Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, has offered commercial suborbital flights aboard its new Shepard spacecraft since 2021, but the company is currently grounded amid work to resolve a booster problem that derailed an unpiloted research mission last year. Thursday's flight was Virgin's seventh piloted suborbital mission since an initial test flight on December 13th of 2018. After two more test flights, Branson and a crew of six completed the company's fourth space flight on July 11th of 2021 climbing to an altitude of 53 miles. After standing down to upgrade the EVE carrier jet, Virgin launched a fifth piloted test flight with six company employees on May 25th, followed by the Italian research mission on June 29th. Virgin plans to eventually ramp up to a flight per month. And for our last piece of news today, Russia launched its first robotic mission to the moon since 1976 on Thursday. The Luna 25 spacecraft, also known as the Luna Globe Lander, lifted off at 7.10 p.m. EDT, or 23.10 UTC. If all goes according to plan, Luna 25 will spend the next five days journeying to the moon, then proceed to circle the natural satellite for another five to seven days. The spacecraft will set down on the moon's south polar region near Bugoslowski Crater. Once down safely and sound, Luna will work on the lunar surface for at least one Earth year. It took longer than expected for Luna 25 to get off the ground. Its liftoff was delayed for nearly two years. One major countdown delaying issue was sparked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which began in February of 2022. The European Space Agency, ESA, had been set to provide the Pilot D navigation camera built specifically to help Luna 25 perform a precision landing on the moon. Due to the invasion, however, ESA canceled the camera cooperation, along with a number of other collaborative space projects. But getting Luna 25 on its way to the moon remained a priority, one highlighted by Russian President Vladimir Putin. In an April 2022 visit to the Vosnachny Cosmodrome, he said the sanctions placed on Russia by the US, the European Union, and others would not deter the nation from carrying out space exploration. Despite all the difficulties and attempts to interfere from the outside, we're definitely going to implement all our plans with consistency and persistence, Putin said. In terms of landing, the 1.6-ton Luna 25 is fundamentally different from its predecessors. Past Soviet lunar landers touched down on the moon's equatorial zone. This new lander will set down within the circumpolar region of the moon in a site that involves tricky terrain. And that's all folks, if you want to support our channel and get access to exclusive content, please consider becoming a patron by clicking the link in the description below. We appreciate your generosity and your passion for space exploration, and as always, this is Kevin from Great Space